This is a short Warmaster video focusing on artillery. We will look at different types of artillery, focus on their rules, and explain how best to use them and how best to protect them. The role of artillery in Warmaster is to provide long-range threat projection across the battlefield. In this regard, artillery can be considered a psychological weapon to use against your opponent. Your enemy is unlikely to want to expose their most valuable troops to the threat of artillery fire. This is because the majority of artillery can bypass enemy armour completely. So when placing your artillery, you can effectively deny to your opponent large parts of the game table because whatever moves into range is going to get hit with several armour-piercing shots. In the example shown here, the Dwarf Artillery is to the top right of the picture and the Dark Elf Artillery is bottom left. The Dwarf Cannon can cover the marked area of the board, forcing the Dark Elf player to avoid this threat. And likewise the Dark Elf Bolt Throwers can cover this area of the board, preventing the Dwarves entering it without risk. However, the threat of artillery is entirely dependent upon the terrain of your table. In this example, the large number of woods severely limits the line of sight artillery has. So it's very important to keep moving your artillery around throughout the battle so that they can continuously reapply their threat against the most valuable targets. So let's look at some different types of artillery. So starting from the left, the most threatening type of artillery you are likely to face are two stands of long-range armour-piercing artillery, such as cannon. Cannon are very cost-effective, as for only 85 points, each gun kicks out two shots with 60cm range that completely ignore armour, and then pass straight through their target and bounce a further 5cm, inflicting one hit on any other stand bounced through. Cannon also count any defended target as in the open, and any fortified target as defended, so they will usually hit their targets on a 4+. Thankfully, at time of recording, only two armies have access to such monstrous artillery, and that is the Dwarfs and the Empire. Next, at centre-left, we have a single stand of 60cm range armour-piercing artillery, in this case, a Skullchucker. The Tomb Kings, the Orcs and the Bretonians have access to this type of artillery. Each artillery piece has 60cm range and will kick out at least 3 shots which completely ignore armour. As a new rule for Warmaster Revolution, this type of artillery can also now fire blind and shoot at the closest target without having line of sight to it, although their chance to hit is reduced to a 6 in such cases. The weakness of this artillery is that it cannot stand and shoot. Moving on to centre right, we have a 2 stand artillery unit with medium range and armour piercing, in this case undead bone throwers. This sort of artillery has two shots per stand, completely ignores armour and has a range of 40 centimetres. Once it has hit its target it will also travel straight through the target stand and will cause an extra hit on up to two stands positioned directly behind the first. It's worth noting that two armies, notably the High Elves and Dark Elves, have access to repeater bolt throwers which function differently. They have the same 40cm range but do allow arm saves and they produce 3 shots per stand. Finally on the right we have a single stand of medium range artillery that produces multiple shots, in this case an Empire Hellblaster. The Dwarfs, the Empire and the Skaven all have access to this sort of artillery and it's most commonly seen as a point defence weapon used to protect other artillery pieces from attack. Generally speaking, this sort of artillery does permit armour saves and is usually very cheap at around 50 points per model. It is quite usual for artillery to be brigaded together and often with a mix of longer and shorter range types. This allows the long range artillery to focus its fire upon the same target while the shorter range artillery deters attackers. It is also much easier to order one brigade of artillery to move all together than several separate pieces. The best defensive position for artillery is clearly one that prevents attack from the front, 
whilst still giving a clear line of fire, in this case positioning artillery on top of a cliff edge. All types of artillery are permitted to move onto hills. This gives the bonus of defended status against incoming attacks and also an elevated line of sight. When shooting from or to a hilltop, artillery is the only type of unit in the game which is permitted to draw line of sight overhead intervening units. You can also use impassable terrain features which do not block line of sight to protect your artillery such as water features. Always take a moment to clarify with your opponent what any terrain feature actually is and what type of units can or cannot enter it before placing your artillery next to it. You may find that some individual impassable objects such as houses have enough room between them to squeeze your artillery pieces between and this is great to prevent flanking attacks. However don't hide your artillery away at the expense of drawing line of sight to a decent target. Walls also offer good defended status to artillery without blocking their line of sight. In addition, chariots and any other machine that uses wheels cannot cross walls, so you are safe from attack. Positioning in a gap between two woods is also a good defensive position for artillery. Be aware however, as this may protect you from monsters, chariots and cavalry attacks, it will do nothing to stop infantry from flanking you. Built up areas are a new type of terrain introduced in Warmaster Revolution and can be entered by any type of unit. They function very similarly to woods, so limit line of sight to 2cm within them, and give artillery defended status. Surrounding your artillery with cheap infantry is one way to protect it from enemy attack. In this formation, two units of skeleton warriors have arranged themselves in column on either flank of the Skullchucker. The infantry will prevent enemies from flanking the Skullchucker, they also completely prevent frontal attacks against the Skullchucker by stands with a frontage of 40mm. However, this formation does not stop enemies with a frontage of 20mm from charging against the Skullchucker. This sort of charge is specifically permitted by the charging rules in Revolution. Now, in this example, whilst the Knights will be exposed to counterattacks from the Skeletons, and the Skeletons will add support to the combat, the enemy may think the risk is worth it to take your artillery out with a well-timed charge. And this is mainly because artillery is automatically destroyed if it is forced to retreat from a losing combat. Another defensive tactic is to place missile infantry directly adjacent to your artillery. This means that any charging enemy is going to contact at least one unit of missile infantry and the volume of stand and shoot attacks can often be enough to deter a prospective charger from attacking you in the first place. Another tactic is to use infantry in irregular formation, like these troll slayers, and place them behind your artillery. The idea is that you turn one stand of the defending infantry to face the opposite way from your artillery. This is especially useful if your enemy has flyers as even if the flyers land behind your artillery, your defending infantry is still going to be able to draw a line of sight to charge them. And one final way to protect your artillery is to surround it with monsters. Anyone charging this brigade is likely to lose, although the amount of points required to provide this level of protection is not very cost effective. Returning to a previous example, one of the benefits of surrounding your artillery with friendly troops is their ability to direct the line of fire. For example, this formation allows you to focus the fire of the Skullchucker between the front two stands. And throughout the battle you can actively use your infantry on guard duty to your artillery to move and block disadvantageous lines of sight to targets you do not wish to attack. In this example, the Skullchucker would rather shoot the knights than the steam tank, so the skeletons are moved to block line of sight to the tank. <laughs> By far the greatest threat to any artillery piece are flying units. Flyers can easily manoeuvre behind your lines and attack you in the rear. 
as they have a massive 100cm movement range. Flyers with a frontage of 20mm are especially dangerous, such as these eagles. Flyers based like infantry, such as harpies, cannot focus as many attacks across their frontage as eagles can. All flyers can charge you from a distance of 60 centimetres, however, and unless you are protected by infantry or in a defended position, a single unit of flyers has the potential to take out an entire brigade of artillery. Cavalry is also a significant threat to artillery due to its high movement speed of 30 and its ability to focus many attacks across a small frontage. Knights are especially dangerous as they have such a high armour save. And remember, a charging enemy only has to win the combat by a single point to destroy your entire artillery brigade, as they're automatically killed when they retreat. Always try to minimise the risk of being charged by using such things as point defence artillery like this Hellblaster. Come on in. All painless is waiting. And in this example, the charging cavalry are likely to sustain six hits from the stand and shoot, which will be enough to remove at least one stand and may end up winning the combat for the artillery. And finally, always watch out for enemy artillery targeting your own, especially if they have a longer range. In this example, let's assume your sneaky enemy has managed to position some flyers right behind your artillery brigade, ready to charge them next turn. So in your turn to counter this threat, you order the artillery brigade to move and turn to face the flyers. But oh no, you fail the order. What happens next? Well, Warmaster Revolution does permit units that have failed an order to have a half pace move, provided they stay in formation. So you may think, great, I'll just turn my artillery brigade around on the spot and I can shoot the enemy in my turn. But there's a problem. A half pace move for artillery is only 5 centimetres. And by turning the whole formation around, you've effectively moved the Hellblaster from one end of the formation to the other. Now this is wrong for two reasons. One, that's a move of at least 6 centimetres. And secondly, you've swapped the position of the Hellblaster within the brigade, which is not allowed. But it gets worse. Say you ignored the Hellblaster and just wanted to turn the cannon around 180 degrees on the spot. You can't do it because you don't have sufficient move. Basic trigonometry tells us that to turn a formation of 40 by 40 millimetres completely around, the corners have to travel more than 5 centimetres. And the Warmaster Revolution rules are very explicit that each stand must have sufficient move to reach its final destination. So the best you're going to be able to do to react to this threat with a half pace move is to move the formation 90 degrees, which is perfectly fine. You have sufficient move to do this with 5 centimetres and you'll still have line of sight to the threatening flyers. In this example, the artillery is in real trouble, being threatened to the front by cavalry and to the rear by flyers. Now you may decide to only order the Hellblaster. As this is a single stand, even with a failed order, you still have sufficient move to turn 180 degrees on the spot. The problem is that you cannot turn completely around without at least part of your stand passing through the neighbouring cannon, and this is not allowed in the rules. So your only real option to deal with this is to move the Hellblaster away from the cannon on its own with a separate order and turn it 180 degrees. Either way, you're still screwed. As previously mentioned, artillery is the one type of unit in the game which can draw line of sight over intervening troops. In this example, the undead bone throwers cannot see the flagellants as their line of sight is obstructed by the skeleton archers in the front. However, the bone throwers can see the enemy cannon as they are in an elevated position. And likewise, the cannon can see the entirety of the undead formation. All artillery must shoot at the closest target, so the cannon have to shoot at the skeleton archers, while the bone throwers have to shoot at the cannon. Now granted this may seem a bit counterintuitive, as you would rightly assume that the cannon being higher up is in the better position. In this example the key to protecting the cannon from enemy fire is to replace the flagellants. By placing the flagellants directly in front of the cannon, still on the hill but on a lower tier than the artillery, the flagellants are now the closest visible target for the bone throwers to shoot at, while simultaneously they are not blocking line of sight for their own cannon. 
The general rule of thumb for artillery on the ground is that it can see everything that is on a higher level than itself, although woods, buildings and other similar tall obstructions will still block line of sight. Likewise, if your artillery is in an elevated position, it can generally see everything that is in a lower position. You're only supposed to blow the bloody doors off! <laughs>